let's quickly cover the next subject. Let's make the patient now same guy, 60 year old, but now instead of the three liver mets, has three liver mets plus some retroperitoneal adenopathy and about five lung mets, all right? All PET positive, so nobody's really thinking about going after surgery. And let's give the guy some frontline chemotherapy, pick your poison, it's about four to six months in, had a nice response, CEA coming down, asymptomatic. Um, what do we do now um, with that patient? And let's start, Fadi, by describing a couple of the clinical trials that help inform this so-called maintenance window. So give us the dream study. How'd that work? <laughs> well, what we have learned in the last 10 years, as you mentioned in your opening, that we transformed a bit this disease to Long, not long-lived, short-lived, but chronic illness. And so I would actually argue that our median survival is the same as breast cancer now, metastatic breast cancer that's ER negative. And we actually cure some patients. And we cure some. So, so yeah. we, you know, we, I'm, you know, when I've thought yeah. about that, we've made it to the big time, guys. So we need, but definitely these, are cytotox, these cytotoxic agents are toxic, and keeping quality of life is important, and keeping ongoing cytotoxic is not an option. So we learned from the Optimox and to a certain extent from the macro study that we have to limit the cytotoxic and then maybe continue on with the, maybe 5-FU, the easy cytotoxic as compared to oxaliplatin, maybe a biologic, the anti-androgenic. And uh, Axel is gonna comment on the Cairo 3 study about both, you know, 5-FU and bevacizumab. The DREAM, the double inhibition reintroduction of the Abastin and Erlotinib study led by the French looked at patients being treated for up to six months with standard chemotherapy. It could be Folfiribav or Capoxbev or Folfoxbev. And then after that, if the patient have benefited, no progression of disease, then randomized to a real maintenance Bevacizumab or maintenance Bev plus introduction of Erlotinib, which is not anywhere part of the standard of care in colon cancer. But I think we're copying a bit from the lung model. And sure enough, the study was uh, optimistically positive by shy improvement in the uh, response and the overall survival. But definitely this is not a standard of care uh, change uh, in the game at the time being. I thought this was bold. Here's a drug they actually tested in colon cancer as a single agent. It had failed. Of course, this was a long time ago. And, and what's interesting, may I add, although the overall survival was not improved, but when they looked at the KERAS status, it sounded in this study at least, although it was not powered enough, that it didn't make a difference. And this make us to be very careful at taking information from one drug to another, even if they're acting on the same uh, EGFR, for example, and not to translate findings across different diseases like lung cancers and colon cancer. Yeah, realizing there'd have to be a lot of work done to get this together, but is this dual VEGF, EGF rearing its head? Well, well, so it, I think it's, it's rearing its head in that I think some of us are re revisiting the question of BEV plus an EGFR antibody. I'm not sure that the tyrosine kinase inhibitors can play well in this disease in these well, patients. But we've got one now, right? We've got a tyrosine kinase inhibitor in this disease now. Okay, we're going to We do, <laughs> we do, we do. But, but, um, do Cairo 3 for us so we can put all this into context. Cairo 3. So the idea is, you know, follow this induction maintenance th th strategy. And I think it's pertinent to use such a strategy if you want to maximize treatment duration, if you especially if you start with an oxaplatin-based regimen. We all know patients stop oxaplatin not because of, let's say, progression, but mainly because of toxicities. We all are wary, and you know I think the sensoropathy that we're inflicting on patients is something to take very seriously. You so do actually, it with Erie? Just out of question, you know, actually, guys. I, I you optimiri? I optimiri. I optimiri. Yeah, 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 I need to. Just you know, want to not, clarify. It's not as important, you know, and you don't have, let's say, these predefined numbers of cycles, but um, myelosuppression, fatigue, liver. you know, liver, I mean, over time, you want to limit the exposure. Sorry. And so the, you know, I like the Cairo 3 design because, you know, this needed to be taken on. We needed to really show or take on, you know, does maintenance therapy really work? And we have ample data that the, inter, uh, the fluoroprimidine bevacizumab combination is actually clinically very active, like the AVEX trial, kifcidabine bevacizumab in frontline therapy in elderly patients. This is an active combination. So the Cairo 3 study took patients with first-line therapy, had at least stable disease after six cycles, meaning 18 weeks, of capecidin, moxaplatin, bevacizumab, and those patients were randomized to stopping everything. This was the old way of thinking, you know, stopping therapy after a certain number of cycles or continuation of 
chemo plus bevacizumab in a capecitabine plus bevacizumab maintenance arm. One point that I like to make, I love the capecitabine dosing way that it's is my favorite way. It is, <laughs> it's a way that has really changed the way at Mayo Clinic how we design I, a maintenance therapy. Low dose, continuous right. capecitabine like EOX in we gastric cancer. We give weekends off. Do you give weekends yep. off? I don't give weekends oh, come off. On. I torture my patients. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it really amounts to 625 milligrams per meter squared, BID continuously. Do you do the math or do you give a gram BID? You know, actually, I do, I do more do or less give a gram. You do the gram BID. Gram BID Others? and adjust it a little bit. I, I learned from you, Dr. Marshall. There you go. I've, I've, <laughs> I've, I've seen a couple of patients who've moved out to the West Coast from, <laughs> from your area after they've left government, and I, sure enough, they're on low dose Cape side of Well, in the interest of time, is this the standard of care? Is Cairo 3 the standard of care right now? I mean, for me, it is my practice. It was before that. It yes. was before, yeah. and it informed my practice. I think it now. informs my practice now. So let's say, let's yeah. tease this out a little bit. Let's say now it's six, eight months, because mm -hmm. this happens. You have these yeah. maintenance people. Which drug do you stop first between the CAPE and the BEV? Why, why do you have to stop one of them? Well, because I don't want them to have a stroke. No, nah, yeah, no stroke. So I'll tell you which one I'm stopping. It depends on what toxicities you see. Maybe I don't need it, is all I'm saying. Maybe I don't need it. Then there's subsequent data that makes me worried about stopping BEV. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I think the issue is dare you stop any of these drugs at yeah. which point? So you keep them going. John, I do. The, the issue, what I like here is if you add the first line, the six act of CAPE ox BEV to this whole mix, for these patients with stable disease at that point, medium progression free survival from the start of first line therapy was over 15 months. Right. And that is actually something we should not underestimate. This is when I talk to my patient, I say, okay, we'll push the cancer back and then use the least amount of treatment that's needed to control the cancer long term. So, you cooperative group people, is this the new control against which we can put drugs? <sighs> Well, so the challenge here, of course, is how, is how do you write this down and how do you legislate this? And, and a lot of, I think, what we've uh, recognized is it's not lines of therapy, it's sort of strategy of therapy. And I think it's uh, having done 80405, led 80405, where you tried to legislate, you realize that you just can't do that anymore. So, in fact, yeah. this will be very difficult to, to probe it moving yeah. forward. But in, in all honesty, the intergroup is actually really looking at this maintenance part of treatment to look at a kind of more targeted interventions. So the idea is you give your induction phase, which gives you time to test for molecular alterations, and then put patients in buckets and use the maintenance setting to really investigate new drug and the druggable targets. And that's a strategy that's actually also embraced in Focus 4 in the UK trial. So I think it, we, different groups came to the same idea that this setting of maintenance therapy might actually be something that is worth exploring.